in terms of casualties and uh, physical damage, uh, the death toll continues to increase. We are over 220 uh, confirmed uh, uh, people who have died as a result of the explosion. Uh, there are over 7,000 uh, reported injuries. Dozens of people have been reported missing, uh, anywhere from 30 to 100, depending on how you count these people. Uh, over 300,000 people have been rendered homeless, either because uh, their homes are completely destroyed or uh, do not provide adequate shelter at this moment. Three major hospitals in Beirut were destroyed uh, or forced to shut down in the aftermath of the explosion because of damage sustained. Um, by some estimates, over 8,000 buildings were variously affected as a result of this explosion. And of course, talking about this physical damage, we're not even touching on the psychological and emotional uh, uh, effects of the explosion, the traumatization that it caused, and in some ways, the re-traumatization for populations and individuals that have experienced uh, uh, too many uh, um, uh, explosions, invasions, bombardments, and, and other life-threatening events. I'd like to just stress here that I think it's important to also note that it's not only Lebanese citizens that have been affected uh, by this explosion. As many of you know, uh, Lebanon is uh, uh, home to uh, a large population of refugees, primarily Syrian, but also Palestinian and others, uh, migrant workers, and other populations. And in fact, a significant number of those that have been killed as a result of the explosion have been confirmed as Syrian or Bangladeshi. Um, so this has been an explosion that has affected uh, uh, communities across citizenship status. And this is perhaps something that we can talk about when we think about the politics of aid and relief uh, that's going on. In terms of the causes of the explosion, uh, I think the consensus explanation for why this explosion was so massive is because of an alleged 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate that were improperly stored in the port of Beirut. Uh, ammonium nitrate, for those of you that are unfamiliar, is a highly explosive substance that could be used for bomb making or fertilizers. And those of you that might be familiar with the Oklahoma City bombing of Timothy McVeigh, just to give you a sense, he used about two tons of this material for that explosion. And we are reported to have had 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate uh, in the port of Beirut. Um, there is no consensus on what caused this ammonium nitrate to explode. Um, one narrative is that it was an accident due to a fire or a spark that started elsewhere and then spread and caused the ammonium nitrate to explode. Another narrative is it, that it was some act of sabotage, either domestically or internationally. And when they say internationally, they mean Israel. Um, yet, we do not know uh, what caused the spark. And I don't think it will be any short period of time until we know what caused the spark. What we do know is that whatever the reason for the explosion was, uh, the condition of possibility was the fact that ammonium nitrate in approximate amount of 2,700 tons was improperly stored at the Beirut port for over five years. Uh, local journalists have been exploring this story and being quite brave in what they've been revealing. Um, they have identified that this material was at the port since 2014 and that every relevant bureaucracy and top level politician was aware of its presence and aware of the danger that it posed to the port, the lives and the livelihood of the people around. Just to be clear, this includes the port authority, the customs administration, the various security services, the army, the judiciary, and several ministries and ministers, including the president of the Republic of Lebanon. Um, I think it's important uh, to highlight this because uh, this is what much of the political discussion is pivoting around now, that uh, despite not knowing the full story, there's enough to understand that there was 
at best criminal negligence, at worst something much more sinister at play with this irresponsible storage of this explosive material. Um, allow me to just summarize briefly the government response so far. For those of you that are unaware, uh, a state of emergency has been declared in the city of Beirut, which means that uh, the city of Beirut is technically under mili military control right now. The army has the final say on any matters with regards to uh, uh, political, social, economic uh, uh, affairs in the city of Beirut. This was initially passed by the cabinet. It was then approved by the parliament and it has now been extended for an entire month. Uh, so the state of emergency in Beirut will continue until uh, first half of September. Uh, second response is that the prime minister prior to his resignation had initiated an investigation. Uh, this investigation was supposed to have been completed already and the findings of that investigation were supposed to have been shared with the public already as was promised. Uh, the findings have not been submitted as far as I'm aware, and uh, the report has not been made public. Uh, we do not even know if the report has been completed. Um, third element of the government response, if I may be quite blunt, is the uh, relative absence of state institutions from any meaningful search, rescue, and aid response in Beirut uh, uh, whether at the port area or the surrounding areas. Much of uh, the response that we've seen has been by non-governmental uh, civil society organizations uh, uh, and, and volunteers, individuals that have given up their time, uh, uh, if not uh, some of their resources to provide this aid. Uh, the largest concentration of state officials that I have seen uh, as I've walked around Beirut and tried to understand what is it that the government is doing has been basically to secure government buildings. And if you saw what happened last weekend to uh, disperse, repress or otherwise contain protests um, against uh, what has been unfolding. In fact, just to be clear, there has been not a single politician or political person in office that has uh, willingly or otherwise taken responsibility, issued an apology, or said anything meaningful with regards to this uh, uh, matter. And uh, I really mean this in terms of the entire set of major dominant political actors, irrespective of their ideological differences or international affiliations. Um, I'll end by saying that, of course, this explosion is the most recent in the wake of a series of multiple crises that have already significantly harmed people's bodies, uh, their livelihoods, and their sense of security. Uh, there is a developmental crisis in Lebanon. Um, we have over 40% unemployment right now in Lebanon. We have over 50% of the population living uh, below the poverty line. Um, there is a fiscal crisis in which the government uh, simply has not been able to generate enough revenues to maintain any of its uh, significant commitments. Uh, it has defaulted on its public debt. The currency has depreciated uh, more than 80%. Uh, people have been locked out of their dollar deposits, forced to withdraw them at rates well below what we would call the market rate. Of course, you are very familiar with the dilapidated infrastructure in Lebanon, which is why Dr. Shaib or myself at any point might have to get off this call because the electricity might cut off. But don't worry, we've made arrangements with Dr. Khatar to uh, alleviate that situation. And on top of all of this, of course, before the explosion, the COVID-19 pandemic was just uh, gaining momentum and there has been an immense surge. Um, so uh, if you think about the hospitals alone, and the healthcare system in Lebanon, between the developmental and currency crisis, between the crisis in electricity um, and uh, other forms of infrastructure, between the diversion of resources to COVID-19, and now the destruction or closing down of three major hospitals in Beirut, the healthcare system is in dire uh, uh, crisis. Um, I'll end with this final point is, of course, that in October 2019, there was a popular uprising that emerged that continued until January, by some estimates until March, until the lockdown happened. There's a huge question mark of whether this explosion will catalyze that uprising to reemerge. 
I think we're yet to see if that will or not, and we'll probably talk about it. Uh, but the amount of uh, devastation, the amount of anger, and the amount of demoralization uh, that is palpable in Beirut amongst people of different political persuasions is, is uh, uh, not just remarkable in an analytic sense, it's actually uh, uh, deeply disturbing uh, uh, to see a population that has had to endure so much. Um, I'll end my comments here and uh, turn it over to Dr. Mahashai. Thanks, Ziad. Thank you, Akram, for inviting me today. Um, today, on, you know, I will be talking about politics, something which I don't always do outside uh, um, the field of education, except politics at this stage. Um, I hope that you can hear me clearly. Um, okay, I'm going to start with the uh, poster or the graffiti uh, by uh, visitor. Fellow and professor at AUB, Rima, Dr. Rima Majid, who is studying social movements since post civil war. The, um, the statement behind me is, ba is basically saying for those who can't read in Arabic, um, what a shame, what a cha shame they, they married Jawaz al Lira al Abdullah. You know, they, they married the uh, Lira to the dollar. Make much sense in English, but basically, what we're witnessing now. This is a statement from now. You know, you might think actually it's from yesterday or maybe three weeks ago. So the situation we're in now, unfortunately, I think it's a continuation of the system that has been fabricated post Taif. This consociational democracy. But unfortunately, in my view, I feel it's killing any opportunity for us. Um, I think the explosion is just a straw that's breaking the camel's back. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's not the break, it's not the back of the, uh, um, of the politicians or the regime. At the moment, it's happening at the expense of people. live in Lebanon, but at least today I've met two or three uh, people who um, are leaving, at least. Many, many people are leaving. Um, I'm going to stop the video because it seems the line is breaking, just in the, with the hope that the, uh, you can hear me clearly. I'm going to try. It's a little bit better, Maha. The, uh, um, better. So I think, unfortunately, the, 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 despite the intensity and the severity of what happened, um, if we listen to the response of politicians, what did uh, um, Owen, the pres president, Owen said? He called it an opportunity. What did several, it's amazing how several politicians, opportunity, to break what he called the siege on the influx into the country and that will hopefully save this failing state. It's a state that is failing its citizens in all sense. If we look at what is, is um, you know, the way the, uh, the economic crisis have, um, um, shall I join you via WhatsApp? Just to be, um, okay, I'm going to, hopefully you can hear me now better. Uh, okay, I'm going to start, try to join you via WhatsApp so you can hear. But this is the quality of the failed state. So if we see, I think the, the, the severity of the politicians, so basically it's an opportunity. Uh, Al-Quwad um, uh, called it Al-Kata'ib, actually called it a Ashrafi explosion. So, you know, an attempt to sectorize, explore their position. If we look at how they also addressed activists and demonstrators, basically, it's a clear message. If you uh, want to change the regime, and Nasrallah said it very clearly, 
you know, you're asking for a civil war. Um, Basile said it again, you know, we're not um, defend and we're not scared. So, so the equation is very clearly, and this is the thing what is causing us all to lose hope. I think most of the activists at the moment, at least of despair, There's a system, a regime that it is going to uh, persist in its agenda, and it's. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Not going to you're change. In. Jana, I think uh, one, you know, this system. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. If you can. Let me try to join the WhatsApp. Well, let's try through with WhatsApp and see if it works any better. Go ahead. Uh, I, we can hear you, but yeah, uh, I can hear you, but it's still kind of the quality isn't a hundred percent. No, it's okay. Now it's better. Let's try to see if it gets, gets to through the microphone here. Go ahead. I don't know how much you've managed to hear from what I'm saying. Is that better? Okay. So, um, what I'm happening more than any time before, the regime is telling us it's also the civil war. There are no, no choices here, but this. And, and, and there's no hope. You know, Greek singer responds. And I was uh, down there. Feeling the sense of regret. We feel that, you know, they're ready to crush. They're obviously feeling strong and empowered. And I think the very best uh, with the Hariri uh, court. An attempt to, you know, uh, continue to divide the as a, a sister, and unfortunately, this. Maha, I'm afraid it's just cutting in way too much uh, in and out. But I want to highlight. Sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, uh, I wonder if we can uh, if we can try moving to a different place with the phone and just do it from the phone and in the meantime we can start taking some questions and if you can call me back we'll try to do it via the phone okay uh, I, I apologize for so I'd like to apologize for this uh, but as uh, Ziad said earlier when we were doing this part of the frustrations and challenges that has been facing every single Lebanese person, uh, but particularly, obviously, those who are not part of the elite of Lebanon, is this exact problem that you encountered on this call that I'm sure you were frustrated by. And that's just a small sample of what people have to live with in day, day in, day out. Electrical issues, uh, talking about, obviously, connectivity and the variety of things that uh, people have almost in dig daily indignities they have to deal with. I mean, to this day, for example, Lebanon still has the highest cost for mobile phones, and it still hasn't gone to the point where they've been talking about this for a while, where they want to increase the infrastructure uh, for uh, the internet, and they still haven't been able to do it. So uh, Maha, I think, is trying to connect via her phone, and we'll see if that works. So uh, if not... Let's see. Is this better? Yes, that's much better. Be? <laughs> okay, great. Um, I don't know where, how much you managed to hear what I've been, what I'm, I'm try, I tried to say. Uh, I think if you can just do a short synopsis of what you said, because it okay. comes out overall. Okay. So I'm just basically, I think, you know, this is, this is the straw that is, is breaking the camel's back, but unfortunately it won't be the regime's back. I think still this regime 
will prevail and this is i think is behind a sense of huge despair that we currently feel the messages we got from the politicians as yeah there's no apology there's actually a discourse this is an opportunity to get more dollars this is an, you know, and, and any attempt to shake the regime is, is, is there is a threat of civil war and obviously no one has weapons at the moment but you know groups that we know of so, so um, so, but, but I think part of the problem has been this confessional uh, democracy that's been set up um, since the civil war. And if we look at different countries that look like us, like, like Iraq, et cetera, we see that this system of power sharing just means basically stealing the resources. In a study we did in 2016 on, on the discourse of reform amongst all political parties in Lebanon, you know what, and, and we invited them around the table and you know what they said, so far, it's been Berry who's taking the, um, the lion's share of these uh, jobs, of resources in terms of basically jobs. Now for us, we all want a bigger share. This is the sense of reform that they have. And I think this is, this is what, ex you know, th there is no more state. I think we are in a state of a failed state. Um, I think donors didn't play at all a positive role. And, um, and, and, uh, and today I saw an email from, or a message I think was tweeted by colleague Shahad Chaban, who's, who, who rightly is boycotting any meetings or relief calls or um, attempts for reconstruction that are initiated by donors. And, and, and I've been meeting and writing for donors, uh, including an article saying, please stop funding this corrupt regime. You're just helping to sustain them. And we know that they're not producing any any positive uh, outcomes out of this. So um, we hope, you know, unfortunately now I feel more than before, although I never, I was never for any kind of international, I'm still not for international interference, but I think um, at least stop funding this failed regime, stop funding this corrupt regime. Um, I, I will stop here because I think we've lost quite a bit of time with the connection. Thank you so much, Maha, and thank you, Ziad. Uh, what I would like to do right now is, uh, as I said, uh, many of you have submitted some questions, and what I'd like to go through is the categories of questions and allow Ziad and Maha to discuss it. And I would like to start out by something that Maha alluded to at the end, which is the issue of, of uh, international aid uh, to uh, the beleaguered nation of Lebanon and its people. And the, the questions you know, is really related to what Maha just said. What is the safe way to send a donation for relief? And what kind of relief organizations should we be supporting? Uh, as I said earlier at the beginning, uh, for those of you who joined us a little later, at the center's website, lebanesestudies.ncsu.edu, you'll find a link that gives you a list of aid agencies that you may wish to contribute to. But I would like both of our panelists to address this whole notion of aid. What do you see on the ground? that is really needed anywhere from medical to humanitarian, food, uh, cultural, uh, anything that in your mind, but also the co larger question, which is how do we go about giving aid to people but not aid to government? Maha, would you, would you like to go just because I feel like uh, uh, you had been touching on that and I want to give you more time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all right, personally on an individual level, it's, uh, you know, I feel really sad that we're talking about relief. And personally, I haven't been able to in, engage or be part of any relief uh, attempts. I'm not saying, I think relief is super important, but it really makes me sad to feel that, you know, a lot of the discussion these days is around relief. I, I realize that there are huge, you know, people have lost a lot. And now you have, in my house, I lost the glass, I have to pay in dollars. If I have dollars, maybe it's still, it's a very high bill for those who don't have dollars. It's an unbelievable bill. Uh, so um, at the moment, I think some of the NGOs, uh, Akram, that you have put, really managed to provide a lot of support. I think we need to always seek um, and be aware of NGOs that are inclusive, that don't discriminate between refugees and non-refugees. I've seen some NGOs advertising and saying, we give support only for the locals, by locals meaning Lebanese. So I think it's, it's important to go for those who um, uh, don't discriminate with, amongst nationality, but I think amongst the list you have, it's very important. I think people should write to their embassies 
um, or to their governments demanding that these governments don't give any aid. Unfortunately, I think although some governments are saying we're not giving uh, a lot of aid to the government, because some of these international NGOs, and this is why I, I would uh, encourage people also to, to work with local NGOs, they have MOUs with government. So for instance, if you want, if I'm an NGO and I want to give X amount to, uh, to let's say Maha to support her health, I have an agreement with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that I shouldn't give more than 400,000 liras, which would be equivalent to $5 at the moment in the current uh, rate, because this is the minimum wage. So there are some restrictions that some international NGOs are suffering from, which is really, really um, undermining the kind of interventions that happen. I think if you can work with local communities, uh, local initiatives, that would be really uh, an added value, but also write to your government and your MP demanding that aid doesn't go to the uh, government. Ziad? I think what uh, Maha said is, is what I would agree with 100%. Uh, I would just highlight um, uh, two additional factors. Uh, the first, some of you might know that there was a French government sponsored uh, aid conference uh, last weekend, and uh, um, uh, or, or rather the weekend immediately after the explosion in which there were $250 million pledged from France, the UN, and, and other countries. Now, those uh, countries pledged to send that aid directly to civil society organizations or NGOs. Um, I would just like to say that it's also important to recognize that many of the political parties have extensions through various NGOs and civil society organizations. This is why I think there's one cannot escape the responsibility of due diligence, of understanding the communities they're trying to help and, and the organizations they're trying to help and asking those organizations, once they've identified them, the best way to get you what you need. Do you need cash? Do you need us to wire it via the bank? Um, do you want us to send you a container of supplies? Um, there, there is no substitute for these kinds of, of questions and actions. And, and I agree with what Maha is saying. Uh, relief is incredibly important right now, but it's also very frustrating. And it's a dilemma for a lot of activists, by the way, who have limited amount of energy of do you pour it into relief or do you start waging the next round of the political mobilizations that people understand are necessary to continue pressuring uh, uh, this system. I will finally say something that uh, to echo what Maha said. Um, I believe that all of these crises that I mentioned, the developmental, the fiscal, the currency, the infrastructure, uh, COVID-19 and the explosion um, have a variety of contexts and causes, but they are ultimately and largely homegrown and as a direct result of the leading political parties, politicians and political class in Lebanon, irrespective of ideological differences and their alliances with different international actors. However, I do hold most international actors and regional actors responsible, whether it's the United States, Russia, Iran, or Saudi Arabia, France, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank, who for over 30 years have subsidized the political system in Lebanon and have pumped money into the system, knowing what's happening with that money, but simply to try and keep it afloat. And if we want to talk politics today, we know that there's already talk by all of these actors for a national unity government as a way of unlocking additional relief aid. But a national unity government or a single coalition government from either side of the political spectrum in Lebanon is precisely the types of government that have led us into this, these uh, 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 multiple disasters. And so uh, I think we should focus the conversation on local actors. But uh, uh, you know, for me, the, the, the Macron visit was incredibly infuriating uh, because it reeked of hypocrisy relative to the role France has played, not only historically in the mandate period and in the civil war, but since the civil war in support and certain political parties and this overall political system. Well, this actually is a very good segue, uh, the conversation that you and Maha just alluded to to a larger question that people have been asking, and I'm gonna summarize it a bit, which is about the local politics of the event. Now, clearly, uh, as uh, Ziad alluded to, 
the issue isn't how the ammonium nitrate ignited as much as the fact that it was stored there and it becomes a symbol of the absolute ineptitude and corruption of uh, the state uh, institutions and functionaries. Uh, so there has been efforts year in, year out, but as again Zian mentioned, especially in October, of civil society attempt to, in essence, peacefully overthrow the existing regime, which has been in place since the days of the French mandate in the 1920s or 30s, was reaffirmed with the Taif Agreement in 1990 after the Lebanese Civil War, and it's this kind of feudal sectarian distribution of political power, and civil society is trying to overcome that in a variety of efforts. Uh, so I think the question that has emerged from, uh, uh, from all of this is how is this possible? Is it possible at this point for non-ideologically or politically affiliated actors in Lebanon, the folks who have been protesting in October and as recently as last week weekend, is there a way, a vision uh, beyond what we have right now to create a Lebanon that is more representative, uh, less you know, politically corrupt, and more, uh, and where people who are elected are held accountable? Do you see any way that this could be attained? And if so, what is your vision of that? Uh, Maham, please. Okay. Um, so I just want to start with where Ziad finished. This regime couldn't have lasted all this time without the support of the various parties who are still making negotiations at our expense and, at the, and they're still proposing the same names for the new government. And, and the Diab was just seen as like, a, it's, it's a joke, basically, this, uh, this government. Uh, and, you know, he was basically, well, Barry wanted to make him whole, being, get held accountable for what happened. Now, I don't know, personally, I've never been as pessimistic as I'm now concerning the, um, uh, the mobilization that has happened. Although we've been seeing it, we have seen it for a long time and it has been increasing. But uh, unfortunately, you know, the situation is getting worse and we're not seeing the same momentum as we've seen in the demonstration that started in, in October. Uh, it could be partly Corona, but I think, I think also the, the different activists on the ground have missed many opportunities for um, organizing, for, um, you know, taking a leadership. And there has been many reasons. Some would say any leadership, you know, they, they automatically, uh, the, the regime will start to, um, you know, find many issues with it. And basically, uh, in the end, you end up be looking like a traitor. So this is why they, they started this approach of not having, you know, a, a, a revolution without a leader. So, but I think all of this didn't really help uh, the, uh, the um, you know, the opposition develop. We don't have any active um, uh, labor movement. Uh, all unions are either co-opted by the regime or uh, too weak to have a say. And, uh, and this sectarian regime has managed very strongly and very effectively to really de de you know, deconstruct and break any attempt to mobilize. So for instance, one of the strongest uh, syndicate movement was the teachers unions. And um, remarkably, you know, finally they managed to really um, uh, achieve something on the ground. The next election, they were easily co-opted by the different political parties who won the next election. So uh, I'm not very optimistic. I would really love to hear from Ziad how he thinks the, you know, um, what options we have as a local uh, mobilizers and actors. I also want to highlight one just before I, I pass it on to you Ziad is, is also there is this kind of like, we want to do more, you know, this discourse. We are activists, but we don't want to do politics. I think this was just like what we saw in Beirut Medinity is like, oh, we're not in a political movement. This is also the half-hearted political kind of activism is not, hasn't been very helpful. And, and it really managed to weaken the different groups that are active on the ground who have really some good propositions, but they failed to really do any kind of leadership. They failed to uh, start a very a strong political party that managed to go beyond the uh, sectarian uh, lines. Just to, to follow up on, on what Maha was saying and, and build on some of what Akram was saying. Um, 
uh, I, I actually think, um, and, and here I'm just nuancing what you were saying, Akram, and not uh, um, disagreeing with you, but I, th I think the issue is not that we don't want uh, anyone who's ideological. In fact, we all have ideologies. Um, and I think we should be transparent about that. The problem is that the entire political class, and let me be very clear, just so I'm not vague, I'm talking about the free patriotic movement, I'm talking about the future movement, the Amal movement, the Lebanese forces, the Kata'ib, Hezbollah, the two Druze dominated political parties. Um, and, and, and I'm also talking about the Maronite church, uh, the Mufti and, and a few other uh, uh, institutions and their business networks in, in Lebanon, their ideology is twofold, Ta'if Accords and the National Pact. And if you listen to the political discourse, that's the only thing these political operators always fall back on to prevent any kind of change in the Lebanese system, when in fact it is the National Pact and the Ta'if Accords and the political system these two uh, agreements created, that is uh, at the root of allowing these political parties to reproduce um, their power. Now, yeah, if I, may, just, I am... Uh, yeah, just quickly, could you actually yes. explain for those who do not know what the National Pact is, what the type of agreement is, could you give a little bit kind of a history, just a short brief history? Sure. It's, it's very dangerous, as you know, as a historian, Akram, to ask a historian to give a brief history. But uh, basically, uh, the Ta'if Accord is basically the, the peace agreement, in quotations, that ended the civil war and uh, facilitated the transition of militia leaders and, political, uh, and their political leaderships to transition into the current political system. So um, the Ta'if Accord is what, the, is what led to uh, the parliamentary seats being divided at a 50% ratio between Muslims and Christians, as opposed to a six to five ratio. The Ta'if Accord is what led to creating the Troika system, meaning you have uh, the president, the prime minister, and the Speaker of Parliament who have almost equal and overlapping political and administrative authority which has effectively led to gridlock. The, the, you, nothing can get done because anyone can veto the other at any point, right? Um, these, these are some examples of, of the Ta'if Accord. The National Pact is the alleged agreement uh, uh, between uh, Khouri and Riyadh, the so independence president and the first independence prime minister, that there would be a, a division amongst the major offices along sectarian lines, that the president will always be Maronite, that the prime minister will always be Sunni, and the speaker of parliament would always be um, Shi'i. Now, note, I want you to know, there is no legal text in Lebanon that requires the president to be a Maronite. There is no legal text in Lebanon that requires the prime minister to be Sunni. There is no legal text in Lebanon that requires the Speaker of Parliament, right? So these are uh, uh, the, the National Pact and the Ta'if Accord together, I think, are what constitute the ideology of many of these political parties. Um, I share Maha's um, pessimism about the current situation, but I do feel and, and, and criticism of the political, op the independent political opposition in Lebanon. But I do feel that each stage in this popular mobilization, if we start with the 2015 garbage crisis and then look at the 2016 municipal elections and then look at the October 2019 mass uprising, that there has been an increasing coalesc coalescing, uh, deepening of networks, lessons learned. So for example, there was a massive rejection of the idea of political parties previously, but now I think the big debate is which political party should we create to be able to wage the next level of the political struggle against this political class? So I, I, I think these processes of change are very slow. They're not linear. It's not about progress all the time. Uh, uh, there can be many steps backwards at, at, at different junctures. Um, and with regards to what Akram asked in the beginning about what does, what would a different Lebanon look like? I think most independent uh, activists uh, have a clear idea of the kind of the principles they've been called for time and time again. It's an independent judiciary. 
which has been a major call for many people. Um, it's an electoral law that is non-sectarian. And again, by the way, the constitution does not require that parliament be comprised of sectarian quotas. This is a result of an electoral law that is passed by the parliament before every election. The fact that when you vote in the elections, you have to go back to where your nufus are registered, meaning your family's uh, original villages. So most residents of Beirut cannot vote for the Beirut municipality or the Beirut parliamentarians. They have to vote for the municipality and parliamentarians from where their families are originally from, right? So these are reforms that have been called for and asked for. Um, of course, we could talk about the personal status courts. We can talk about the fact that Lebanese women can't pass on citizenship if they're not married to Lebanese men. Um, the list is known for the major big ticket items. Um, the disagreements I think that Maha is pointing to is how to get there and how to prioritize that list. Um, and, you know, it's frustrating, it's difficult, but it's part and parcel of any, I think, uh, a challenging situation. I think it's also important to recognize that these political parties do have their followers. Uh, either for ideological reasons or material interests. It's really important to understand that while large numbers of people, and at one point in October, an estimated 2 million people were in the streets of Lebanon. If you think of 2 million people relative to a population of 6 million, that's one out of every three people was out in the streets on one of the Sundays in October 2019. That is quite significant. On the other hand, these political parties do their supporters for a variety and for a variety of calculations. So I think one of the things the independent activists are going to have to think about and struggle with is not only to create a machine for them, but also to think of how to peel off the supporters of these other political parties. Um, but I, I think people are starting to think and strategize about how to either reinvigorate street protests or how to translate the energy from the streets into some kind of system or political party. But the difficulty, again, is that the rules in Lebanon are designed to keep the people in power in power. And, and this is the conundrum that people are, um, and, and the political class has been unrelenting. It has not made a single concession since 2015 to any of the protests. Forget changing the regime. It hasn't given them a, it hasn't even fixed the garbage problem in Beirut. Garbage is still piled up in Beirut today. There are illegal uh, garbage burning dumps and sites happening all across the city and Mount Lebanon. Uh, they have been unrelenting. Um, and, and this is a challenge, I think, but, but one that is unfortunately uh, part of the course of history, so to speak. But in the meantime, too many people are dying, suffering, and, and otherwise uh, being traumatized. And that's the really heartbreaking thing. Thank you, Ziad. Uh, and thank you, Maha, very much uh, for th these insightful uh, comments about these things. So uh, what I would like to sort of follow up, because I think that's kind of a natural question, is the issue of accountability. Uh, and again, you know, one can talk in the immediate term, the accountability for the explosion. Uh, you know, where you have somebody is going to, like you said early on, Ziad, there was a report that was promised five days from August uh, uh, 4th, but that never came through. Uh, there is conversation, debate, disagreement about whether international uh, inspectors should be brought in or not. And again, we've seen shifting positions. Uh, but the question of accountability is one thing that I would like to follow up on, uh, but also kind of connected for both you and Maha with what we have seen with the state and the various political actors within the state doing last Sunday, which is in October, although there was some crackdown on demonstrations, we didn't quite see at least the level of violence that was unleashed as last Sunday in which it was purposeful violence. And not only that, but even speeches that were being delivered that basically said, if you continue to protest, uh, we will have fitna or chaos. And basically that's code word for we will have a civil war again, which means we will have a great deal of violence. So it seems like the state is taking off some of the restraints or at least the threats of restraint on physical uh, violence against civil society protests. So I'm kind of curious if you can 
discuss these two things, beginning with Maha, then turning on to you, to you Ziad. Um, okay, I want to emphasize a point which uh, I think Ziad rightly pointed out too. Despite, you know, the setbacks that we have seen in these different uh, mobilization attempts, I think there, there has been progress that has been achieved. And there has been some initiatives that are at least pushing for some accountability. For instance, I, I would just name a few. We have the syndicates of independent judges, which has been, uh, that we have a legal agenda has been doing very important work on the legal dimension. So we have, um, uh, we've been having some movements who are really trying to push for some reform, whether in the form of protest or in the form of, you know, um, civil society organizations. Um, I think maybe the level of, you know, um, tension that we, we saw last week, maybe because they felt, and I think this is what uh, Nasrallah alluded to saying that, you know, like people want to use this as an opportunity to kind of up, uh, to throw uh, the regime. And I think we all felt like it's either now or never, it's us or them. You know, when, uh, when, you, ex when we, you experience that kind of, uh, you know, intensity of, of corruption that basically, whether it's corruption or not, that erupts in your face and, and destroys uh, a large part of the city, you feel like, you know, you're being threatened in your own home while you're just getting on with your life. So, so I think people felt this huge intensity. But I think there's another element which I think as uh, actors and activists, move, although in the last demonstrations that started in October, we do see, we begin to see some decentralization of this mobilization. So for the first time you see some of the, you know, demonstrations happen in Nabatiye, you know, the heart of the Hezbollah area, or the Beqa, or, or Zoo, um, Kail, or Musbah, you know, different areas that are known for being the headquarters of the big uh, sectarian uh, parties. So, uh, but I think not, you know, this is where activists need to invest on the local level. And I think this is what we haven't succeeded in. Many of the activists remain to be more of an elit elitist group. And, and this is, I remember when we did this, uh, 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 study about the reform and how political parties were doing when we interviewed some of the local initiatives, although they were not registered political parties, you could see that, you know, it's kind of a utopia and a very, um, you know, I don't know how to say it, very idealistic and not pragmatic as, you know, they, they have these sectarian parties that know how to do uh, local politics that uh, exploit the whole system. Uh, Bernie's emphasis on the quota and the jobs uh, is not, uh, you know, by chance. And, uh, you know, there have been, even with the latest AUH uh, layoff of the staff, there have been negotiations on names and, and uh, the quota of different political parties. So, so these are, you know, sectarian parties that are very, very strongly and deeply rooted everywhere in the private and the public sector. So, uh, you know, I think the only way to throw this regime or to reform it is, uh, you know, protests and demonstrations. And the more we can mobilize, um, maybe not now, maybe it won't happen in, in the next few years. I'm, I'm not very optimistic, but I think, uh, you know, we, we need to start investing in syndicates uh, and, and investing in political parties, creating the structure as much as possible. Yeah, I, I would uh, echo especially the last point that I think the, the direction that activists are going are to think more in terms of uh, political machinery um, to, to accompany um, these kind of mass protests, um, whether, whether they be political parties, um, whether they be syndicates um, uh, or others, because these political parties have been uh, the, the dominant political parties, the political class has been successful, both because they have access to state institutions and can divert resources or deploy the army or the security forces, but also because they have the political machine to mobilize their, their supporters and their base and, and, and act in a disciplined fashion. Of course, some of these parties are able to act in a much more disciplined and effective fashion than others in terms of the political class. Um, and, and I think activists are, are starting to, to go in, in that direction. With regards to the accountability question, uh, Akram, I think there's a very 
uh, robust conversation going on now of is, is the explosion an opportunity to rethink what accountability would look like in Beirut? Um, meaning is this the time to maybe hold the kind of uh, popular courts uh, and, and tribunals that were held? So you want something local uh, that is independent of the government because the government as currently constituted in any way, shape or form cannot investigate itself, right, uh, uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, you can't really trust side powers who helped create this system and unfortunately are looking to this crisis as an opportunity to advance their own interests, right? So, um, for example, I don't know if you guys read this article in the Wall Street Journal where the Trump administration is considering uh, using sanctions against associates of Gibran Basile and Saad Hariri. Um, when asked why these sanctions would be uh, uh, waged, it wasn't because they're guilty of robbing the Lebanese people. It was because they want to show them that there can be no reward for being allied with Hezbollah. Okay, if external actors are simply intervening in Lebanon to either side with Hezbollah or isolate Hezbollah, then the actual interest of the people has been taken off the, the board. And so I think the, the challenge of accountability in Lebanon is to act independently of, of, of the government and um, these political parties, while at the same time act independently of these outside powers, whether it's the US camp or, or the Iran camp, mind you. Um, and this has been the dilemma in Lebanon, in the Middle East, and most of the post-colonial world for so much uh, um, and, and so long. Um, I would, however, say that I personally think the struggle needs to be to reclaim the state. The right now, I think it's right to deprive the state of foreign aid. It's right to not turn to the state for accountability but the demands of the protesters must always be vis-a-vis -vis the state because the, the, the ultimate goal, if, if any kind of transparency, accountability, and social justice is to be realized in Lebanon, is for the state to be more responsive and responsible towards the people who live in Lebanon. Um, and, and, and that is a very difficult struggle to, to wage, but one that, as Maha said, people are thinking and strategizing about. Thank you both. These are really very, I mean, generative comments that you've been uh, giving, and I think it produces, of course, even more questions and uh, more thought. But uh, I want to quickly talk about, because this is something that people asked about before uh, the webinar, which is something you mentioned, Ziad, and Maha alluded to as well, uh, this whole notion about uh, the regional and even international context in which we come to understand the Lebanese states and its failures. Uh, you know, I think both of you have mentioned money uh, and support uh, that has come from outside to sustain this, in many ways, illegitimate government uh, and state. But I think there's more to it than money. So I'm kind of curious if you could both talk a little bit about how you see Lebanon's pos positionality you know, within the region and within the international diplomatic and political uh, tug of, tugs of war that go on and how that has allowed or promoted or possibly sustained uh, the current state to continue for since 1992 to today, which is quite a long time, 30 years on. Well, um, I might give a quick answer to this because I think, I think it could be a whole webinar, if not more on its own. Um, I think it's important to realize that at the time when the civil war ended and the Ta'if Accord was signed, there was international consensus for the imposition of the Ta'if Accord, and that Syria would be the enforcer of the Ta'if Accord uh, uh, among all political actors uh, in Lebanon. Um, I think the overall consensus um, about uh, Lebanon and what would happen in Lebanon changed over time, and now we have this dramatic polarization, of course, between what, what we can call the, the US camp and the Iran camp um, um, in, in Lebanon. Um, so in some ways, uh, 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 Lebanon is um, a, a product of uh, international and regional powers trying to compete with one another by either scoring points against their allies or gaining ground vis-a-vis -vis their allies in Lebanon. And this is why I think it's really important if, if 
what makes change in Lebanon so difficult amongst many other things is the fact that it's not always just about Lebanon, right? And, and unfortunately, there are other calculations at play. And what we need to do is get to a point where people in Lebanon can agree, disagree, or sort out what's going on without this major chess match going on in, 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 uh, uh, in Lebanon. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's really important uh, uh, for what's happening. And I can't, I can't overstate how frustrating it is where every crisis in Lebanon becomes an opportunity to redraw the map in Lebanon vis-a-vis -vis external actors. So uh, is, is Hezbollah culpable in the current regime? Absolutely. Is Hezbollah the most powerful actor in Lebanon? Absolutely. Is, is, is the disappearance of Hezbollah going to make all other problems disappear? Not necessarily, right? I mean, we, we don't have Hezbollah in other countries, and yet we have many of the same problems of corruption and authoritarianism and, and sectarianism and so on and so forth. This is not a justification or a defense of Hezbollah, but this is an analytic point that killon yani killon, right? All of them means all of them, the slogan of the October 2019 protest. So for those of us who live on the outside, and I'm not, you know, unlike uh, Maha, I don't live in Beirut or in Lebanon permanently. And so I'm, I, I speak of myself as those of us living in the outside. Um, outside, the most important thing we can do, I think, is to stop intervening uh, in ways that are not responsive to the desires and needs of the majority of the population, right? Uh, I think that is the most important role. I, for example, I don't call for intervention in Lebanon. I call for stopping intervention in Lebanon. Intervention is ongoing in Lebanon in various sources. We can ask who has trained the internal security forces and the army in Lebanon? Who has provided them with the tear gas, with the water cannons, and, and with the other weapons that they've used to, to bludgeon protesters uh, and, and to break up encampments in Riyadh al sulah and other parts of the country, right? These are important questions to ask that uh, have to do with the international uh, uh, alliances that have been made. Thank you, Ziad. Maha, could you address this perhaps uh, from your vantage point, which you talked a little bit about earlier, but really not so much at the level of diplomatic, if you will, or you can if you'd like to, but also at the level of international aid organizations and NGOs, because you have firsthand experience with that. You've been very involved with that. So I'm kind of curious, uh, if you can speak to this con uh, comment that Ziad made about intervention, uh, how it applies at the level of uh, international aid organizations, as well as, of course, as, if you like, uh, political uh, you know, institutions, organizations, and states. Um, so I totally agree with Ziad that unfortunately our biggest uh, issue has been international intervention. And while every party says, oh, stop international intervention, and, and often they accuse protesters of being, uh, of aligning with other international groups. You know, we all know that these political parties couldn't have persisted if they didn't have the support of foreign uh, countries and powers, and, and, and this happens on all levels. I think with the, the, but you know, I think the international intervention can happen on political level in, in uh, through um, ministries of foreign affairs and embassies, and it can also happen on, on donors level. And I think, um, you know, as Ziad mentioned earlier, this corrupt regime wouldn't have persisted if it wasn't for the donors' continuous support. And I think the Syrian crisis, like Lebanon always claimed that the Syrian crisis is, is the main reason behind its economic collapse, which is totally, uh, you know, untrue. Actually, Lebanon has gained billions of dollars from the Syrian crisis. And Lebanon, particularly the Free Patriotic Party, have basically exploited the racism of the um, global north in terms of xenophobia and, and um, uh, determination to keep refugees here. They, you know, if we listen to Elias Abu Saab before and now, who was an ex-minister, uh, he basically kept telling, they, I remember during a visit that Cameron the ex-Prime Minister of UK, uh, he basically told them with every 1,000 uh, Syrian refugee you, you get to Europe, there are X number, I can't remember now, the 
exact figure of ISIS militia. So I think Lebanon has been exploiting all these crises to get more funding from donors. And, and I personally witnessed firsthand, whether through UN agencies or non-UN agencies, how, explo you know, how corruption is, is basically you know, ignored, um, it's documented, and then they forget about it, and they continue to give funding. And I think this is all because of an international decision to keep this regime going. Uh, and I think that's, you know, um, despite some investment in local NGOs, still the bulk of the funding, at least I know in my field of education, we haven't been short at all of, at all of any funding but we haven't seen any kind of reform and there's zero accountability. And they will continue, although sometimes you hear some threats, etc. but there is, you know, continuous uh, feeding for this corruption. Thank you both, uh, uh, Maha and Ziad. Uh, there is a question that has emerged uh, about the recent verdict that was issued in the Hariri assassination. Uh, that was issued by the International Court in La Haye. Uh, and I want to get to that question uh, in, in just a bit. But I also, before we get to that one, I really am kind of curious about the issue of the Syrian refugees that Maha brought up, because I think it's a very important issue. And a lot of people outside Lebanon are really quite unaware of what's going on on the ground in terms of that issue. Clearly, it's a political football that gets traded uh, for money, for, uh, for power, and so on and so forth. But how is a civil society, forget the politicians and their efforts to, you know, to use racism and bigotry to politicize the presence of these refugees and to make money off them. But I'm kind of curious how uh, the, the, you know, uh, the civil society organizations are imagining, if you will, uh, the Syrian presence in Lebanon, uh, because clearly there's a great deal of need there as well, financial as well, educational and so on and how they see a resolution to that issue, whether it's integration within the society at large as part of the community, many of whom have been there for over 10 years now. So I wonder if you can speak to that a little bit before we get to the point of the verdict on Hariri. And we can start out with Maha. Uh, so I'll start with the Syrian issue as this has been the focus of my uh, work. I, unfortunately, I think um, whether as academics or activists, we are, drowning in this humanitarian discourse. And this has been one of the key criticisms that I personally try to, 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 to address. This humanitarianism and relief paradigm doesn't really get you, um, get you beyond the crisis. And I think it's just produced this economy of dependency. It's a short term intervention and it's apolitical. It's a super apolitical um, uh, you know, for, for a very political uh, crisis, you know, you can't, it's not about food only and shelter. Most refugee crises last for 20 years. So um, yet we keep treating them as if they're going to go tomorrow back home. So I think it's a, this a humanitarian model that NGOs have been, you know, uh, unfortunately, and, and, you know, UN agencies, not only local and just a whole discourse around refugees is, is a discourse of exceptionalism uh, and of, you know, uh, helplessness, etc. And this is why I think it's, it's time for NGOs to politicize these issues. When I say politicize, I think a right-based approach to uh, refugees and the refugee crisis is a super uh, it's super important. Otherwise, you know, in all fields, it's like if you go to Jordan, you meet families that have been living and dependent on aid. They have food and shelter and nothing to worry about, but they don't have a job. They don't have a future. They don't have anything to hope for or to aspire for. This is not a life. Um, and this is just, this is, you know, utter despair. And, and you see it in the, in the, uh, uh, in the voices and uh, and what people say. So I think one big issue that we have to deal with in, in this discourse on refugees is, is to look beyond the humanitarianism. Um, uh, I, we can talk for, for longer around this issue, um, but I don't wanna take, uh, uh, I know we don't have much time, um, but I think civil societies in Lebanon haven't helped, unfortunately, challenge this discourse. I think they helped sustain this discourse. I think what happened in Lebanon is is the state has claimed most of the response, most of the relief, used it to sustain itself for a longer period of time, 
and to be honest, in the most xenophobic, nationalist, you know, and, and emphasizing segregation. If we look at least in education, we have the vast majority of refugee children learning in segregated schools and afternoon shifts in conditions that no one would accept uh, for his children, let alone for extremely vulnerable populations. So, um, and the UN agencies have been supporting this. Um, what matters is keep them here, sustain them. And uh, in the worst case scenario, I, and I hear it a lot from requests coming to us at the research center, is, can you do for me a study on refugees and extremism? It's like, you know, um, this is the maximum. When they want to think of them politically, they think of them as suicide bombers. Um, and this is, whole, you know, this is the whole issue of how you think about refugees that I think we need to deconstruct and unpack. Thank you, Maha. Ziad? Yeah, I, I would, uh, I echo what, what Maha says. The, the two things that I would add or just uh, uh, put a uh, 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 highlight on is the first that uh, I think because many civil society organizations and NGOs in Lebanon are dependent on foreign funding in one way or another, the influx of Syrian refugees uh, caused for them a diversion of funds to, to, to refugee aid and a shortage of funds on other projects. And so many NGOs shifted their agendas simply to follow the money in one way or another. Uh, and other NGOs that were unwilling to do that were in some ways left out of the total pie that was available in Lebanon in terms of foreign funding. So I think this speaks to a broader issue in terms of um, how foreign aid incentivizes what kind of projects are built and worked around and how sudden changes in that foreign aid can affect people. But uh, uh, absolutely what, what Maha said, the Syrian population has been scapegoated. Um, uh, uh, it's not the Syrians that are causing the internet to be bad. It's not the Syrians that are causing electricity to be bad. It's not the Syrians uh, that uh, caused uh, people to be locked out of their dollar deposits or the, the Lebanese currency to depreciate. It's, it's not the Syrians that committed massacres between 1975 and 1990 uh, uh, in terms of the Syrian refugee populations. Uh, so I think it's really important. Uh, the xenophobia against the Syrian refugees echoes a larger discourse in Lebanon, which is it's always the outside world. And I take very seriously the role of external actors in Lebanon, but we cannot uh, relieve local actors of their responsibility and they are primarily responsible for the state of affairs in Lebanon and they are the ones that should be primarily held accountable for the state of affairs in Lebanon. Um, we, with regards to the um, Hariri Tribunal, uh, I'll just say two things and then, and then pass it back to Maha. Uh, the first is that um, the tribunal was set up almost 15 years ago uh, and cost almost $800 million. Uh, um, uh, uh, I think it is a example of uh, how futile, corrupted, and politicized international tribunals can be, and how at the end of the day, there's some kind of a settlement that is made uh, uh, somehow to come up with a verdict that doesn't cause any major disturbance in Lebanon. And, and I think that's what we saw yesterday, personally, in, in my opinion. The other thing is uh, there are plenty of people who have been assassinated and killed in Lebanon. And it was never made clear to me why, uh, and this is not to condone the assassination of Rafiq Hariri, but why is it that Rafiq Hariri gets uh, uh, an international tribunal, and yet we still have 17,000 people who were disappeared in the Lebanese civil war that are unaccounted for, and that the Lebanese government and international community will not do any major work to reveal their whereabouts, uh, right? So, so again, this is because there was political utility for outside powers that were backing the special tribunal on Lebanon vis-a-vis -vis Rafi Hariri. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I think it, it was an utter failure on multiple levels and, and should be used as an example of uh, 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 you know, what to avoid. And it's not a failure because it didn't indict Hezbollah as a party or it didn't invite the Syrian regime. It was an utter failure from beginning to end in every aspect. Um, in such a drain of resources and energy that could have been used for more productive means. Huh? Yeah, uh, I think, you know, we, we spoke before about international interventions, and I think, you know, the court, one, why did we go 
or international court, it shows the lack of faith and belief in our local uh, system. And uh, and unfortunately, but when the, the the Beirut uh, the port explosion happened, there were people again calling for uh, an international tribunal. So it just shows how little faith people have in in uh, in our court system, which although despite I think some judges who are really trying to push for reform and depoliticization. The fact that these jobs are distributed based on a sectarian and most importantly, a political uh, uh, quota uh, means that, you know, it's going to be dependent. It's not going to be an independent. So I, I think it, obviously we are, I don't know, I, think, I was very worried in the beginning that things are going to escalate. I think we might be going at least temporarily for some decent, de-escalation. It seems that there is something happening in the background. And I think the decision of the court, maybe some people say, no, it's a very depoliticized uh, decision, but you know, I think it's all part of, I don't know, personally, um, uh, I think there is something, there's a sort of an agreement. There is a uh, French proposal that's being put on the table and discussed and, and everyone was around the table. So there is obviously something that's is being cooked. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know if it's good news or bad news if there's no escalation, because uh, what we know is that this regime is going to stay. And if the protests don't really take to the streets and there isn't some sort of um, proper organization and strategizing of how we're going to uh, dismantle this regime, how we're going um, you know, to, to uh, I don't know, gain some uh, some of the people who are becoming more and more critical of these po political parties. I, I don't think, regardless, even if there's de-escalation, I don't think it's going to be for, on the long run, something positive for Lebanon. Uh, thank you both. So uh, we are almost to the end of our time, and uh, I, I just want to uh, leave one you know, more and more question for both of you before we sign off. Uh, but again, I mean, although we have been saying that there is a real problem with the way that the international aid community has been funding the state for the last 30 years that has sustained it in its power, uh, you know, the billions of dollars that have flooded, as well as from countries like Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran that have been sending money into Lebanon to sustain the state. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are facing a humanitarian crisis in Lebanon. And again, I would encourage those of you uh, who are, uh, you know, able or are, uh, interested to do the due diligence that Zia talked about. Uh, I have, we are not recommending a particular agency that you should fund. Uh, go to the website, see what you can do to help because there is a great deal of need. Uh, and again, these are you would have to find organizations that are themselves directly providing fun, you know, help and support for the people, not through the state. Uh, it's a bit of a thorny situation I recognize, but at the same time, uh, I would hope that uh, we would be able to provide some support uh, that is needed on the ground. Now, let me uh, finish up with uh, one uh, question that I think in some ways looks back, but at the same time it looks forward. Uh, and of course, such questions are always dear and near to the hearts of any historian. Uh, and that is a civil war. And the question, and I think it's a, it's a very important question, is to what extent the fact that we have not had a truth and reconciliation uh, about the civil war, about the, these massacres. And of course, we can point fingers at uh, the political institutions themselves, but the Lebanese populace in either directly or by silence uh, were somehow embroiled in this, you know, 15 years of horrendous violence. And the question that becomes to what extent is this, are these political players able to stay in power and to raise a scepter of another civil war and you know fitna and chaos uh, every time somebody asks for changes because there hasn't been a reckoning, if you will, with what happened in the war and a, and a real sense of reconciliation beyond the sectarianism that continues to divide Lebanon. Okay, um, if I may uh, start, I mean, this is, this is a question, as you know, Akram is dear to my heart. And, um, and we I personally have been very interested in, in peace education and citizenship education. And we have the Lebanese Association for History created particularly to address this question. So I, I personally, having worked on this for a while, I'm very critical of the, um, 
uh, post-Civil War reconciliation paradigm, this peace and love paradigm. Um, in Lebanon, if we look at the discourse of the Ta, if, if, uh, if you analyze the particular articles that refer to peace building, uh, one is about uh, unifying the curriculum in Lebanon, and the second, creating one history now a textbook and civic education. They failed to agree on this uh, deformed national narrative of history that will not offend any of these, uh, you know, they're warlords in the end. Um, so we don't have a textbook so far, and I'm against anyway a unified history textbook, but we do have one national history citizenship text, uh, textbook that has that is being taught for the past 25 years and, and hooray, look, we have still more and more sectarianism. I think it's this very soft approach to peace and that it's almost a personal issue that I have a personal problem with you, Akram, and this is why we went into a war. It's this unstructural approach to conflict, you know, as if conflict happened because we can't get along and, and we're too angry to, uh, to, to have a dialogue. I think this is a big problem and it's a very Western oriented or global North oriented discourse for understanding uh, conflict and peace building. I think one for, you know, personally, when I uh, would like to teach the civil war and I do teach it uh, for uh, history teachers at university, I, I emphasize a lot the structural issues. And I think these structural issues, whether economic, issues around inequality, injustice, rather than this personal soft approach to, uh, or even psychological or trauma oriented kind of approach of peace building. Um, I think it's, it's time for us to, uh, to have a more kind of honest, more political, because I think another, another paradigm for peace education in Lebanon has been, it's, it's extremely apolitical. We don't talk about political parties. We don't even cover the civil war period. So, so it's this apolitical and forced amnesia and just focusing on peace and love. I think this has uh, been a very, uh, you know, ineffective or the other approach we see in many schools is avoidance. And, and if you go to many schools, you find a sign uh, at the entrance, no politics here. Although everything about the school is political, everything about who's in the school and the principal and the teachers is a super political uh, uh, thing. I, I will stop you because I know we don't have enough time. So, uh, Zia, will, go ahead. Oh, uh, so I, I will just make two comments with regards to, and, and I agree with what Maha said. Um, in fact, I agree with almost everything Maha said. So, um, uh, Two things. The first thing is that uh, civil war is a political decision. It's it's not an accident. People choose to to, to civil war, um, and just like people choose to end the civil war. The other thing is that in Lebanon there was a general amnesty that these political parties passed for themselves as the starting point of the post-war order. Um, and so when it comes to matters of accountability and justice. Uh, yeah, there is an ingrained problem in Lebanon in that none of these people who are currently in power were held accountable for their role, their crimes um, during the civil war. And we can't think how difficult it is to hold them accountable today without acknowledging the fact that they were never held accountable for what they did in wartime. How is it that they're going to be held accountable for what they're doing in peacetime, all right? Uh, and this is an important point to keep in mind. Thank you both. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time at this very difficult moment in the history of Lebanon and also in your lives, because I know both of you are very busy and you're overwhelming. And I cannot thank you enough for taking part of this. I would like to thank all of you who participated with us. I'm sorry we could not answer more of your questions or your comments, uh, given the limitation of time. Uh, and I hope that we'll be able to have another conversation in the near future about this. Uh, again, I would like to remind you that uh, if you visit our website, lebanesestudies.ncsu.edu, and I'm going to share it uh, with you right now, uh, right here. If you go there, you will find a list of organizations that, uh, if you're interested, you can uh, do due diligence and see which ones you would like to donate to. And second, that in a very in a week or two, 
we'll be reaching out to those of you of Lebanese background to ask you to share with us if you are interested, your thoughts, reflections, uh, emotions about what happened on August 4th in Lebanon. Again, thank you so much for partaking in this webinar that is being held by the Khairallah Center at North Carolina State University, and I wish you all a very wonderful day.